Jude, we're in verse, um, we are in, well, I just lost my notes, okay, we're in verse 22, but just for the context, we'll back up to 21. Jude, verse 21, <clears throat> keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That, of course, is not church age doctrine. He's speaking here about you keeping yourself in the love of God. I don't keep myself in the love of God. Um, I can hinder um, the things he wants to do through me, that's for sure. But as far as me, I'm not keeping myself in anything. He keeps me. Amen. And I'm glad for that. <laughs> now, verse 22. And if some have compassion, compassion making a difference. <clears throat> The whole point of this is to make a difference. <laughs> you don't just have compassion on people because you're nice. I mean, you should be nice, but if your whole purpose in being nice is just to get along with people, then it had no point. Our point down here is not to make a bunch of friends. You know, people have these Facebook things and they think it's their life mission to amass as many Facebook friends, fake friends as they can get. <laughs> What's the point? Okay. All of our interactions should have a point. He says on some people, compassion makes a difference. And there's times you absolutely need it. Now, he's going to go on in the next verse and say, do just the opposite of compassion sometimes. Sometimes you need a little hate. You need to have some hating the garments that are even stained with sin. We'll get to it in a minute. Spots, yep. Now, you got to have the balance, and I can't tell you what the balance is, and you can't tell yourself what the balance is. you got to check in with every interaction. God, what's the right response? And he'll, he'll tell you. Uh, look at Ezekiel 34. Judges, uh, not Judges, Ezekiel 34, verse 17. This is God speaking, and he's speaking to Israel as other animals, uh, which is probably not too far off. He says, verse uh, 17, Ezekiel 34, 17. As for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats. There he's saying, I discern, and every father does. It, when you have some kids, you know, you got two or three different kids, they all interact differently. And you have to tweak how you respond to them as God shows you to do it. God says, that's the way I treat my kids. I decide, if you're acting like a goat, I'm going to butt you in the head. <laughs> if you're a sheep and you need to get yanked out of the ditch again, I'll come down there and do that. Galatians, look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, verse 20. A well-placed reprimand is always a good thing because you don't have to do it often. Now, if all you do is reprimand, it makes no difference. It's like parents who yell at their kids all the time. Their voice just gets turned off. They hit that decibel and nobody even hears what they're saying. Okay, just make it few and far between, and then it'll make an impression. <laughs> Here's Paul doing this, Galatians 4, verse 20. I desire to be present with you now, and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. He's saying, look, I would like to have just this reprimand on paper be enough. But if it's not, I'll be there shortly. <laughs> little, little threat in that. And that'll go a long way. Look at uh, Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 1. In Jude, the point of our passage was to make a difference. And we can't, we can't miss this. In Galatians 6, verse 1, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are, are spiritual, expose him and kick him out and tell everybody else about it. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> but that's what most people do. He says he's overtaken in a fall. He's succumbed to it. What's the right response? Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. That'd be compassion. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
unfortunately we see people falling all the time and I know that there's stubbornness in the heart of man <laughs> and sometimes that can only be um, beat out and exposed to be helpful to the body but there's probably plenty of time the Galatians 6 1 could have been used and helped and it hadn't been look at Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews 6 verse 4 now of course this is obvious this passage here obviously not church age doctrine we'll see He's saying you can lose your salvation and you can't get it back. <laughs> Galatians 6 verse 4. I said that. Yeah, just read my notes. It says Hebrews right there. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 6 verse 4. <laughs> yeah, Margaret was teaching me the gap earlier today, so I've been all over the whole Bible. <laughs> he says in Hebrews 6 verse 4 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame Whew, that's not church age, obviously. In the church age, we're supposed to do what Paul says. Restore them in the spirit of meekness. Okay, but there's coming a time. Now, we can identify it clearly. If you're in the tribulation and you go get the mark, it's impossible for me to renew you again. You're done. It's over. <laughs> okay, so... You, you help now there's probably many steps you could help a person in the tribulation before they got to that point but once they go to that point it's impossible to renew them look at it in James James chapter 5 James 5 verse 19 James is aimed at the same congregation the tribulation James 5 19 brethren if any do err from the truth and one convert him okay so he's saying even in the tribulation there's going to be people who have error in truth and those who have the truth are supposed to convert them verse 20 let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins okay so there's a point that you cross a line in the tribulation but not in this dispensation. Now you can cross a line as far as your health is concerned. <laughs> you can cross a line on how much mercy God shows you in this age. But your salvation is secure. Look at it in uh, 1 John. 1 One of the ways you start looking and identifying dispensations is with this little word, if. <laughs> 1 John 5 verse 16 If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he should pray for that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Just haven't ever seen it. But <laughs> now uh, obvious overt sins he says but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not keepeth himself just like we saw in Jude keep yourselves in the love of well, how did he put it keep uh, verse 21 uh, keep yourselves in the love of God yeah so that's somebody's personal responsibility is going back to the Old Testament system of personal righteousness um, we don't have that right now. We've got something way better than personal righteousness. We've got the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's, that's, it doesn't get any better than that. Look at uh, Jude. Jude again. Now he's going to flip the script on us and say just the opposite of what he just said. Jude verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the, <clears throat> the garments 
spotted, or the garment spotted by the flesh. So here he's saying, <clears throat> some people, compassion will make a difference. Some people, fear will make a difference. And you're not going to know what that is. And I say the best rule of thumb is try them both. <laughs> I mean, really, if you've been showing compassion and that doesn't work, then maybe a little fear needs to be installed. <laughs> now, usually I start the other way around. I start with the fear and then go to the compassion. <laughs> because in the day and age we're living in, people are hardened to truth, by and large. And, you know, that's what worked with us. You read your Bible. The New Testament is not first. It's the Old Testament. You know what that installs? The fear of God. <laughs> then you get to the New Testament and find Jesus Christ. Look at uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 verse 14. Here's Paul using his fear, or maybe it's not fear, but you can decide. He says, verse 14, If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. He's provoking them. He's pushing them. Um, you can only do that so far. It requires a person's own free will to be involved. And so you do. You, you, you try to use compassion. Sometimes that doesn't work. You pull out fear. Sometimes that won't work. And you just say, God, it's yours. Take care of it. <laughs> he says uh, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is definitely Paul using fear. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 5. He says, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that, ha that hath so done this deed. Now look at this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you gather together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, every time we sin, it's the flesh's fault. Now, we've got a hand in it because we could, we could not yield to the flesh. However, it's the flesh that gets blamed for it because on the inside, he's given us a spiritual circumcision and the part of us that's saved is not guilty. And that's why we have eternal security. But the flesh is guilty. That's why when he comes back, he's going to blow this flesh apart and put it back together like a new man like his own body. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. The old timers used to do this. They wouldn't tell you how to get saved. <laughs> they would, uh, the, the Presbyterians and the old time Methodists, they would preach hard and heavy hellfire and damnation you'd go to the altar crying and weeping and wanting to know how to get saved and they would say pray through <laughs> you figure it out <laughs> that's we'll probably be, need a little bit more of that nowadays people it's just a magic formula you say these words and you're done everything's good and you might need to install some more of this fear stuff second corinthians 7 look at verse 10 for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame th thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness, carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. There it is. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not for this cause that ye have done this thing, nor for his cause that suffered the wrong. He's referring back to 1 Corinthians 5. But that, you, that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Here's what you do. He's 
showing both means, both the compassion and the fear, and he started with fear. He says, when y'all get together, we're going to have not a, not an exorcism. <laughs> we're going to cast the devil in him. He says, that man, when you get together in my spirit and, and uh, you're all together there, turn that man over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. Ooh. Put the fear of God in him. Oof. Make him wake up. That's what Romans 1 is all about. God doing more and more severe things to a man to make him wake up and say, how did I get here? And it worked in this 1 Corinthians 5 case. The man obviously woke up and now he's showing compassion. Now he's saying, take him back. There's been godly sorrow. He's repented. It's okay at this point. Now you use compassion. You can't, you can't do compassion if there's no repentance. Otherwise, you've corrupted the group. You can't forgive somebody when... Now you can. But you can't forgive somebody that's not asked for forgiveness. Now you in your own self should not hold a grudge against anybody. You should forgive them all and, you know, for Christ's sake. Right. Right. They can't get forgiveness from you if they don't ask for it. Um, for their relationship, as far as that's concerned. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy 4 verse 16. He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, what is he talking about? He's not talking about salvation for eternity. Was Paul not saved? Okay, if we took the word salvation to mean saving from hell, then you need to be a preacher first before you can get saved. <laughs> Take heed to yourself and the doctrine. So, For in so doing, you save yourself. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your testimony, your life. You save yourself from trouble. And that's a fact. Now, a lot of Christendom as we know it today could have been salvaged <laughs> if people would pay attention to doctrine. Doctrine's gone out the window. Most churches... Now, there's a lot of good churches who can give you the practical. And that's good. We need practical. We need to know how to apply the scripture for our everyday life. But that's not the first reason God gave scripture. The very first reason was doctrine. And people can't even understand how to see doctrine anymore. Doctrine means, what does it mean to the person it was written exactly as it says it on the page? And that should be simple to figure out. Well, let's say that. It's not always simple. <laughs> but it should be something that we're accustomed to. He says, proper doctrine will save you from a bunch of problems. Now the fact of the matter is, we got a whole bunch of phony um, denominations and all kinds of who knows what out there because people have not taken any heed to doctrine and they'll mix them all up and if we're not I went to a church one time where the preacher said I don't know anything about doctrine I don't teach doctrine if you want that then go somewhere <laughs> that's crazy why would a preacher claim he doesn't know doctrine I mean you could not know it but don't tell everybody <laughs> okay he said in our passage in Jude that you'll be doing this uh, saving them with fear, uh, hating uh, the, the garment. And he says that's pulling them out of the fire. Now, you would have to really uh, make that some kind of a metaphor to apply it. And that's okay to do. You can make some metaphors and spiritualize and all that stuff. But I'm going to teach you the part that nobody else does. The doctrine is it's literally pulling somebody out of a fire. You know what happens in the tribulation? It's going to be hellfire on earth. I mean, a third of the earth is going to be consumed with fire. Okay? God's 
promised there's one little section down here in Petra that I'm going to be protecting. That one's not going to burn up. Okay? So it's important. Look at Amos chapter 4. Amos, yes, we're covering them on Sunday night. Amos 4 verse 11. This has been a, a theme. Now, there's lots of themes in the Bible, and sometimes there's so many of them you miss them. But if you'll start noticing it, this is a theme. Sodom and Gomorrah was a demonstration of God's wrath. And every time he gets mad, he starts comparing things to Sodom and Gomorrah. Amos 4 verse 11. I've overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Woo. Now, he says, when I burn up Sodom and Gomorrah, we know the story. It was fire and brimstone from heaven. That's not something that would be a normal thing. It doesn't rain fire. I mean, you, California stays on fire, but it doesn't rain fire. Okay, this is something from God. He says, I'm going to do it again. And obviously, he was doing it there in the book of Amos. Look at Zechariah, Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, verse 2. Now, God is particular about a city. He's got his favorite spot on this earth. And uh, he's jealous of Jerusalem. And literally is. Zechariah 3 verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan. Okay, this is getting serious now. The Lord rebuke thee. You know, God wanted to curse the devil. And he thought, you know, what's the worst thing I could say to him that would just really curse him? I know. I'll curse you. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord rebuke you, says the Lord. <laughs> o Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Jerusalem is that brand plucked out of the fire. You'll find in Revelation that uh, it's called Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem is spiritually Sodom and Egypt. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15. Now, if you want to put a spiritual application on it and a personal application, you can do this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. For us, if you can keep a person from getting involved in wickedness, either by compassion or by fear, the benefit to that is their works, their actions that they take won't go through, go up in smoke when we get to heaven. Okay, they'll get some good works rather than those wood, hay, and stubble that are going to burn up. He said they're hating, in our passage in uh, Jude, he said, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Um, this is odd. The garment. Huh? He didn't say your garments, plural. The garment. So it's some spiritual thing that God sees when he looks at a man. He sees you robed in something. And for a Christian, it should be a robe of righteousness that you wear. But I mean, I'm saying it should. <laughs> I mean, well, a lot of times we get an arm in and a leg in, and, you know, half of it's uh, the filthy rags of the world. <laughs> Leviticus, Leviticus 13. Leviticus 13, 47. Jude's basically preaching a Old Testament message because that's what's going to be coming in in the tribulation. In the Old Testament, they knew that if your flesh had filth, it contaminated your garments. And I would hate to be a priest in the Old Testament. You had to be a, a, a theology major and you had to be a medical doctor. And I mean, you had to know it all. Leviticus 13, verse 47. 
the garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it be the warp or the wolf, uh, why are you wearing a wolf, of linen or woolen, whether in, the, in a skin or in a thing made of skin, and if the plague be greenish or reddish in the garment, or if the skin, and then he's going to go through and he's going to tell you how to get a medical degree. <laughs> but what he's showing them here in this passage is that that garment carries the filth. And, you know, you'll put it, you might get yourself cleaned up one day, go back and put on that same garment that's got the filth in it and recontaminate yourself. So, yeah, you would hate that garment, wouldn't you? If you identify that as spreading a plague, okay, the same with these people. He's saying these people are spreading wickedness and it'll contaminate. Look at uh, that whole passage. I'm not going to read that whole passage to you, but it's a good one. Look at the next chapter, chapter 14, Leviticus 14:47. 14, He says, And he that lieth in the house shall wash his clothes. And he that eateth in the house shall wash his clothes. Just for being in the house? I mean, that sounds like uh, uh, COVID on steroids there. <laughs> Social distance and <laughs> if you, you, everybody's got to wash your clothes every time you're around somebody else. <laughs> He's saying if you're in a house that had the plague, make sure your clothes get washed. And you know they weren't carrying around a Maytag with them this was this was some work <laughs> Leviticus 14 Leviticus 14 47 or I just did that one chapter 15 go to the next chapter 15 verse 17 he says and every garment and every uh, skin wherein is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be clean until even. So he's saying there, your clothes have got to be clean. It's not just the man. We want to know everything about him is clean. Now for a Christian, our, everything about our life should be clean. There's no excuse for a Christian to have filthy language. Amen. There's no excuse for that. Yeah, you could get away with it. And I mean, you can justify anything. But why? <laughs> it's filth. So stay away from it. Isaiah, look at Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, verse 6. He says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. That's a good verse, but it's not a church age verse. You see where it's written? That's Isaiah. That's Old Testament. He's talking about a nation who was supposed to be doing the works of righteousness. And he says nobody's been doing any works. And when they were doing them, they were filthy rags. What's he mean by that? He means that they would come to the temple and then on the same day they would go worship Moloch. Okay. Even your righteousness is filthy rags. Now that's the literal doctrinal explanation for it. You can make spiritual application, and you should. Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 4. Lamentations 4, verse 14. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood, so that, uh, so that men could not touch their garments. Now, they could have touched them, but you wouldn't want to. <laughs> you know what America has done? They've polluted the nation with blood. All the abortions that are going on, that's just pure wickedness. Um, God's got to judge for that. I know that. We all know that. Um, a Christian will get as much mercy as God decides to give him, but... It's just a shame the devil has gotten in. If He did the same thing all the way through the Bible. He was always after the seed to destroy uh, the Messiah coming. We've seen that. So what did he do? He would sneak in and contaminate and destroy. Well, he's done that in America. 
He snuck in. He found something that God will curse for. And he made it appealing to men. There's no reason for abortion. Um, and they're killing innocent blood. So there it is. Look at Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, verse 3. Zechariah 3, 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Well, thank you. <laughs> what a compliment. <laughs> Where'd you get that outfit? It's filthy. And stood before the angel, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused the iniquity, uh, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. So he told us something there. This garment that God sees, he sees it based on righteousness or iniquity. So when he looks from heaven, he sees that we're all wearing something that the human eye doesn't see. And it's either a garment riddled with iniquity, or in our age, you have the robe of righteousness. Look at it in verse 5. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. There's coming a day, and I'll maybe cover it, I don't know. In Revelation there, he says, uh, to the bride was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Now that's going to be a day, won't it? It didn't say that the bride had to earn it. It said it was granted to her. That she should, it was a gift. We get the righteousness as a free gift. But there's a lot of people that don't. Look at 1 Corinthians 5 again. Look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9. This is one of these tough passages. And, um, you know, you can become a micromanager. It's easy to become a micromanager of others, not so much of yourself. <laughs> he says here, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world, or the church. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So he's saying there, your fellowship. Now, I don't think that you can't sit down and have a dinner with somebody. You can't sit down and have fellowship with someone, someone like this. Did Jesus do that? He ate with the publicans and sinners. Okay. But he wasn't fellowshipping with them as though we're all on the same team. He was there preaching to them. Okay, so if you're going to fellowship with a, with a fornicator, an extortioner, an idolater, all those other things, go for it if you see it as a mission field. But if you can't be a missionary, don't sit down. That's the passage. Look at it, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33. This is a verse against every modern technology device. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Not that anybody knows what good manners are nowadays anyway. But <laughs> that's something you learned when you were growing up. Your parents taught you manners. That's not good. You're raised in a barn. <laughs> Shut the door. <laughs> You learned manners growing up. Guess what? Christians should have manners. We don't have to be mean and, you know, act like we're uh, hillbillies raised out in the farm. You can be normal and nice. That's okay. But he's here talking about something beyond your physical manners. He's talking about evil versus good manners. You know, if you're going to be a righteous Christian, it'll affect your manners that the world sees. It should. You know what will hinder it? 
is evil communications. You start buddying up with the world as though they're your buddies, that's your friends, and you know what happens? Evil corrupts, and it'll contaminate you. Just like we're talking about that, that garment. 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14. Here's this uh, saving with fear. Now, it doesn't work much nowadays. I, I just, the church has gotten so corrupt. Uh, you, everybody's church hoppers now anyway, so it doesn't. He says, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Now, it meant something back in Paul's day because to say you were a Christian, you just ostracized yourself. You just put, and then just not a hundred years later, you know, it was uh, the whole world against and the Catholics on board with it, you know, excommunicating and burning at the stake and actually killing anybody who claimed to be a Christian. Well, if you were in that group and you'd already said, I am a Christian, and then you start living like the world and won't listen to somebody telling you, hey, that's not the way Christians live, then he said what you do with them is you ostracize them, don't have company with them. Well, now that person is totally out in the cold. That's the Catholics do something called excommunication. <laughs> well, there's a good point for it. Uh, it's just that they're a corrupt organization. <laughs> but they got it from somewhere. Look at Revelation 3. Revelation 3, verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, you can spiritualize it, okay, go ahead and spiritualize it, that's fine, but let's take it as it stands, the way it's intended. He's talking here, of course, tribulation, we're in the book of Revelation. He says, there's some people there who've not defiled their garments, and so they're worthy, okay, uh, I don't do anything with my garments. Um, Jesus Christ washes me as a person. Here he's talking about in the tribulation, he's identifying works that a person does or does not do. Notice the emphasis. Um, they have not defiled their garments, which have not defiled their garments. It's their actions that did or did not do, and that to God makes them worthy or unworthy. Not in our age. Our age, you're worthy based on his son. We're accepted in the beloved, and that's our worth. Look at verse 18. Revelation 3.18. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the, fire, in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You can make lots of spiritual applications to it. Doctrinally, it's obviously works. It's something you're doing. The emphasis is you. Um, in the New Testament, or in the church age, we don't do the works. We have to stop doing works. <laughs> because the works we naturally want to do aren't worth anything. If we would learn to do this, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here, if we would learn to quit resisting what God already wants to do in us and through us, <laughs> then it would be perfect. But that flesh is strong. Back to Jude, Jude verse 24. Look at there, y'all almost finished the marathon. Jude, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Okay, he's able to keep you from falling. That's not eternal security. He's able to keep you from falling, but the emphasis is still on your works. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. So he'll keep you from falling depending on what your desire is in the tribulation. 
Look at it in Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, verse 6. Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. There, clue on who's this, who this is talking to, the next word. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. End of what? <laughs> Obviously the tribulation. End meaning that you'll be there for the second advent. That's what he's talking about. And it's your job to hold, your, hold this confidence. A lot of Christians don't. Don't hold their confidence. And that's not a determining factor whether or not you get saved. Uh, he says, nobody's going to pluck them out of my father's hand. Well, according to that, you could pluck yourself out. Okay, it applies to somebody. Hebrews 3, look at verse 14. He says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. There it is again. I'm made a partaker of Christ I'm not made a partaker of him. I'm in him. I'm made a part of him. <laughs> Somebody's going to be a partaker of him if they qualify. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Every, every preacher loves this verse. They don't know what it means, but they love it. <laughs> he says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, and they stop right there. Because <laughs> they don't know what the rest of the verse means. He says, But exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Well, if a preacher is going to quote that for coming to church on Sunday, then you reply to him, Okay, how are you attending church more this year than you did last? If you're going to use that verse. He says, and even so much more as you see the day approaching. Well, there's a day approaching that they'll be getting together and it'll be very important that they do. That's how they'll stay alive in the tribulation. The day that'll be approaching is the day of the Lord, the second advent. Look at it in verse 30, uh, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Doesn't mean too much to you right now, but if you realize that in a couple of years this Armageddon was about to happen, you wouldn't want to be on the team that he was saying, I don't have any pleasure in that one. Because he's coming back as a man of war. Whew. Okay, to somebody it's going to mean a whole lot. Okay, uh, he said in uh, Jude, Jude, where are we, verse 24, he said, To present you faultless before the presence of his glory. So the purpose of this whole thing is he's coming back. He's going to present you physically, visibly right there. Okay, that has to be the second advent. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 verse 27. We read right by the word glory. Um, but that's the way... You know, when a, when a king or a queen is coronated, they have a big pomp and ceremony, and it's a major deal. I've watched the thing, they got it on YouTube when the queen was coronated, and it was such a big deal, and you know, the streets are mobbed for it and all that, and it would be fun to go watch something like that. But if us little rinky-dink humans know how to do something like that, don't you know when Jesus Christ comes back to be coronated king of the universe? <laughs> that's going to be a show. God calls it glory. And it'll be real glory. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, the great thing about this is, imagine if you had to live through the tribulation, seven years of nearly hell on earth. I mean, not literally, but just about. And you fought through, and you made it to the end, and you get to attend the coronation, 
He says this coronation, the one being coronated, is also going to pass out gifts to the guests. That'd be exciting, and it will be. Look at Matthew 19, verse 28. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's when he's literally, visibly, physically here, sitting in his kingdom. And there's a reward for, obviously, the apostles. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. There it is. It's always connected to glory. That's, we don't realize it, but that's what we're looking for. When we get to heaven, it's going to be glory. But one day, he's going to bring all the glory down with him, and we're coming down with him. Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Whew. Wouldn't want to be that person. Matter of fact, I didn't put it in here. There's a whole passage about, and I don't know the... Uh, I don't know all the details on what it means, but <laughs> there's a passage where he gives a, a thing about th he put on a wedding and somebody came into the wedding without the right garment on and he picked him out. That's him being ashamed of somebody and that'll be bad news for them. Uh, um, maybe. It's in one of the Gospels. It's in the Bible. It's in the good book. <laughs> First Peter, First Peter chapter four. First Peter four, verse thirteen. Jude has started with a really tough message, but he ended on a high note. The high note is look at, look for it because he'll soon be back and he'll be here with glory. Here it is in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4, verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when, he, uh, when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Peter's aiming at that same crowd, that tribulation crowd, the ones that are looking for works. And there he's saying he's going he's gonna to be back. And when he comes back, it's all going to be about glory. And he's, this is the one carrot that they get to hold on to, is that within just a few years, he'll be here. Everything will be fixed. Now, isn't that what we do every four years? <laughs> oh, if our candidate gets in, everything's going... No, it won't. <laughs> but for these people, it'll be a fact. If they can just hold out, he will be back and he's going to fix it all. Now, we'll come back with him. That's the doctrinal explanation of the book of Jude. We finished the whole book. It was only 200 pages.